is terrified at the thought of being captured by the Japanese. We don't really know the whole truth for about 60 years. And four U.S. pilots' bodies were cannibalized after their deaths. U.S. military didn't want the truth about what happened at Chi Chi Jimmy to get out. He didn't even know, and he had been the CIA director. It's September 2nd, 1944, and nine American pilots are being briefed on board their aircraft carrier, the USS San Jacinto. Their target is the island, the little tiny island of Chichijima in the South Pacific. It's about 500 miles from Japan, but it's being heavily guarded by about 25,000 Japanese soldiers. Their mission objective is clear. They're to take out the radio tower. At 7.15 a.m. that morning, the pilots flew off of the aircraft carrier headed towards Chichijima. One of them was a young pilot, one of the youngest pilots at that time, a 20-year-old by the name of George H.W. Bush. He is flying a TBF Avenger, and he's nicknamed it after his sweetheart, Barbara Pierce. He's got two crewmates, Jack Delaney and Ted White. Well, about an hour into their flight, as they catch the radio tower within view, they began to take heavy anti-aircraft fire. And as Bush zeroed in on his target, his plane took a direct hit. And soon the cockpit began to fill with smoke to the point that Bush couldn't even see his instruments. And Bush noticed that there were flames that were working their way back along the wings towards the gas tanks. With the plane on fire, Bush still has the frame of mind that he's going to carry out his mission. And he continued his dive towards the radio tower and managed to drop four 500-pound bombs over his target. And then he pulled his plane back towards the open ocean. As Bush is piloting this burning fireball, he thinks the plane's going to blow up. And it's only a matter of time. In fact, he even surmises that he's descending at roughly 194 miles per hour. And then he ordered his two crewmates to bail out. And at about 2,000 feet, Bush bailed out and pulled his parachute. A U.S. pilot flew nearby and signaled to Bush the location of a yellow one-man raft, and Bush managed to swim over to it, inflate it, and he got in. Well, as soon as Bush's plane went down, the Japanese spotted it and sent a couple boats out to pick up Bush and his crew. And two U.S. pilots at that time managed to circle above Bush protectively. They radioed in for his rescue, and then they opened up their 50 caliber guns on these Japanese boats to hold them off. So now Bush is floating in the open ocean. He's four miles off of the coast of Chichijima with the wind and the waves pushing him towards the island. And all he can do is lay on his stomach, paddle feverishly, hoping he can change his direction. Stop and think about Bush's state of mind at this time. Remember, he's just 20 years old. He had this incredible adrenaline rush after everything that had just happened. He's traumatized. He's in shock. He's just survived a burning plane crash. He hit When he hit the water, he took a bunch of salt water in. He's bleeding from the gash on his forehead. His eyes are burning from the cockpit smoke. He's nauseous. He's vomiting. He got stung by a Portuguese man of war in the arm, which they say is excruciatingly painful. But on top of all that, he's very distraught about his two crewmates. And at he soon realizes that they didn't likely make it. And he begins agonizing over their death and wondering whether or not he did everything he could in order to try and save their life. He said he felt terribly responsible for their fate. And he went on to say, I'm afraid I was pretty much of a sissy about it because I sat in my raft and sobbed for a while. You know, Bush was terrified at the thought of being captured by the Japanese. I mean, he had seen one of the most widely circulated pictures of 1943. And in that picture, it showed an Australian POW that was being beheaded by a Japanese soldier. Bush also knew about the treatment of American soldiers during the Bataan Death March. And so now Bush is floating. He doesn't know if anyone knows he's out there. Will he live? Will he die? Will he be captured? And so for about three long hours, he floats. And I would say it was probably the longest three hours of his life. And then a periscope suddenly appeared out of the water in the distance. And at first, Bush thinks he's seeing things. Maybe his mind was playing tricks on him. But within minutes, the submarine surfaced, and it was the USS Finback it had been sent there and dispatched there to rescue Bush. And for the next 30 days, Bush is stuck on the USS Finback. He did a lot of 
resting at that time. He did a lot of reading. He read a good number of books and he also did some letter writing. My admiration for him grew when I found out what he did afterward. After Bush was shot down, he was offered an opportunity to return stateside for shore duty. No more war, no more being in harm's way. How many, think about how many people would take that offer up, but not Bush. He took two weeks of R&R &R in Hawaii with a few of his buddies, and then essentially he hitchhiked his way back across the Pacific to get back on the San Jacinto because he believed it was his duty. He never thought twice about it. And he, in fact, he said he wanted to finish his mission. What happened to the U.S. pilots who were shot down and captured on Chichijima? We don't really know the whole truth for about 60 years. In 2003, James Bradley in his book Flyboys, A True Story of Courage, detailed the heart-wrenching truth about what happened on Chichijima. He had went back and researched a lot of the post-World War II war crime tribunals that officers and soldiers stood trial for for their crimes during the war. And we come to find out that if Bush had been captured like his other pilot friends and taken to Chichijima, his, his fate would have been the same as theirs. They were beaten, they were clubbed, they were tortured, they were executed. Some of them killed with sharpened bamboo spears, stabbed with bayonets, some of them were beheaded, and four U.S. pilots' bodies were cannibalized after their deaths. The liver and thigh muscles of those men were cut off and cut out by Japanese surgeons and served to Japanese soldiers for food. Later, those Japanese officers and soldiers who participated in that stood trial for their crimes against humanity. You know, the U.S. military didn't want the truth about what happened at Chichijima to get out. And so the information was classified as top secret for years. They didn't want to inflict further pain and trauma on the grieving families of those U.S. pilots. You know, Bush didn't even know about the fate, about what happened to those troops at, on Chichijima until 2003, after the publication of Flyboys. He didn't even know, and he had been the CIA director. What kind of impact did Bush's near-death experience have on him? Well, I think it can be summed up into three words. There are three words that are very prominently posted in his presidential library. Faith, family, and friends. With the faith, it certainly made Bush be grateful for every day that he had that he got to live, living every day to its fullest, all the way up until the time that he passed away. He said, I had faced death and God had spared me. I had this very deep and profound gratitude and sense of wonder. Why had I been spared and what did God have in store for me? It also gave him a greater appreciation for his friends and his family. He said that while he was out there floating in the ocean for those three hours, that not only was he praying and, and hoping that he would be rescued, but it made him stop and think about his life. It made him think about his parents and how appreciative he was of his parents and of the values that they had taught him. It gave him a greater sense of appreciation for them. And it also made him how aware of how much he loved Barbara Pierce. And if he was going to be rescued and he managed to live, this was the girl that he was going to marry one day. You know, Bush said that this near-death experience and the month-long reflection that he had on the USS Finback was perhaps the greatest turning point in his life. It was pivotal. He said it gave him greater clarity and insight into what was important. You know, George W. Bush, at his father's funeral, gave a very emotional eulogy of his father. And in that eulogy, he talked about this near-death experience and the impact that it had on his father, a man that went on and became president of the United States, a U.S. president who evaded capture and cannibalism. Here's Bush's take on how this forever changed his life. One reason Dad knew how to die young is that he almost did it, twice. When he was a teenager, a staph infection nearly took his life. A few years later, he was alone in the Pacific on a life raft, praying that his rescuers would find him before the enemy did. God answered those prayers. It turned out he had other plans for George H.W. Bush. For Dad's part, I think those brushes with death made him cherish the gift of life, and he vowed to live every day to the fullest. After high school, he put college on hold and became a Navy fighter pilot as World War II broke out. Like many of his generation, he never talked about his service until his time as a public figure forced his hand. 
We learned of the attack on Chichijima, the mission completed, the shootdown. We learned of the death of his crewmates, whom he thought about throughout his entire life. If you like what you see on Press Politics, make sure you give us a thumbs up and make sure you subscribe to our channel. Hit your notification button so you know when our upcoming videos have been uploaded. If you haven't checked us out on our social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, do that today.